The attack aircraft carrier. A floating airfield capable of carrying and operating six squadrons of the latest aircraft, over 90 planes. An airfield that can move at speeds well in excess of 30 knots, appear where it's needed in any part of the world. A giant aircraft launching platform loaded with ultra-modern electronic equipment and devastating weapons. She's a vital link in our national security, a potential for power, for peace, for war, but still just a potential until her crew is on board. Then, and only then, is her potential realized. aircraft carrier. She means a lot of things to a lot of people. To the air group, an airfield, a home away from home. To the crew, a place to work and live. She shows a face of reassurance and friendship to friends. A face of controlled power to others. And she provides a flexible, wide-ranging addition to the country's strength. Her reason for being is to get her 90 aircraft into position to destroy a given target, no matter how remote or well defended. This is her job, and the job of the men aboard her. Stand by to start the A4s and the F4s. Check chocks tie down the fire bottles, loose gear about the deck. Helmet on, goggles down. The flight deck. The pilot's in the hands of the flight deck crew from the time he starts engines to the instant the catapult lets go. You've never seen more precise teamwork than these guys show. And you've never seen more rugged working conditions. Even with their Mickey Mouse helmets, the jet engine noise is overpowering. And the heat. You get out on that deck, working with those jet planes on a hundred degree day like you get in the South Pacific of the Mediterranean. And you feel like you're flying. There's always a 30-knot wind down the deck. They walk leaning into it. Tough job? Yes, there's a word for it. Hairy. A mixture of hard work, uncomfortable conditions, and always the pressure of knowing a man's life depends on your job. A lot of them are only kids, 18, 19 years old. But they're the best. They have to be. Every pilot's life depends on them. And they send these planes off to ship like clockwork.
plane in the air every 30 seconds. And at the precise minute they're scheduled to be over target, they'll be there. Between every flight operation, detailed plans are made to shift aircraft between hangar and flight deck. Position planes in the right order for the next launch. Ensure proper fueling and maintenance. There's not a whole lot of time because recovery of aircraft returning from a mission is usually scheduled to follow a launch within minutes. When air operations are underway, the huge hangar deck, almost as large as the flight deck, is busy around the clock. Here, aircraft are repaired and maintained. The job is a tough one, but it gets done. These maintenance men work as hard as anybody in the ship. If it weren't for them and the extra effort they throw into the job, the planes just wouldn't be ready to fly. When the ship is conducting flight operations, keeping planes in the air from 7 in the morning to 11 or 12 at night, many times five or six days in a row, any minor maintenance or repairs must be done quickly. And these guys stay ahead of the game, conducting even major repairs like fast engine changes. The only way to do it is to work 12, 16, 20 hours a day. Catch a nap when you can, wherever you can. And eat a sandwich somebody brings you if there's no time to make the chow line. The peacetime Navy operates at maybe 15 to 20 percent below full strength. But when flying practice missions, taking part in a NATO exercise, or involved in a conflict like Vietnam, well, it's all out. Everything goes. And these men have to deliver, even though they may be shorthanded. It's a tremendous job, keeping these modern planes ready to fly. Things have changed a lot since World War II and Korea. One of today's high-performance aircraft with advanced electronic equipment and the most lethal armament can do the job of several 1940 or 1950 vintage planes. We have more going for us than ever before, but it makes maintenance and repair a bigger problem. And the technicians have to be a lot sharper. These men are top-notch, real pros. They keep them ready, ready to fly, ready to fight, and ready to complete their mission. Stand by to recover aircraft. Stand by to recover aircraft. All unnecessary personnel stand clear of the port catwalk to land near the corral, then board South Island, back away from the mountain. Landing signal officer, ready. Arresting wires, in position. The pilot's landing aid system, on. Bringing these jets aboard at speeds up to 140 knots is another tough operation for the flight deck crew. Too, the precision teamwork under difficult conditions is remarkable. And the crew takes them on as fast as two every 60 seconds.
Sometimes a plane misses the last wire and goes around again. Sometimes the problem is more serious. That's why an emergency crew is always there. And it's a good feeling to know they are. They're trained to go into a burning plane, get the pilot out safely, put out the fire, and quickly clear the deck. Great guys, all of them. After every recovery, planes must be refueled, rearmed, and respotted for the next launch. And always there's that pressure of time. pressure of time, the commitment to be on target with pinpoint accuracy and precision. It's something every man on an attack carrier lives with from launch to recovery. Especially the pilot. Carrier flying takes real professionals because it's a unique demanding job. After every flight, one of the first things pilots do is check with the landing signal officer. the one the pilots depend on to evaluate their landings. Once in a while there's a little controversy over that evaluation, but it's all settled with a videotape playback. Every landing is covered by TV cameras. It gives them a chance to see what they did and to plan any changes that will make them more proficient. These guys are always trying to do a better job. Carriers on station, a pilot makes two, sometimes three flights a day, including a night flight. It's a rugged 24 hours. It's a job even to put on all that gear, let alone fly in it for two or three hours. But the pilots need it, all of it. It's still a tough way to dress for work. You know, it's not like it used to be in the old days, where a pilot jumped in a plane and took off. Flying off a carrier. It's just a job to these guys, so they say. But they'll also tell you it's a kick they wouldn't trade for anything in the world. No question, they love it. Planes in the air, on their way to the target. And the attack carrier's potential is realized. And this potential includes attack bombers, K-2 
capable of carrying nuclear and conventional weapons with the supersonic speed, range, and maneuverability to penetrate the stiffest defenses and deliver a devastating blow to the most remote targets. And low-level attack bombers, capable of providing effective aerial support for ground troops. On these planes, the pilot is teamed with a highly trained bombardier navigator who operates the ultimate in electronic blind flying aids. Regardless of the type of aircraft, frequent practice missions prepare the crews for the real thing. To be effective, the attack carrier must have a defensive capability equal to its attack potential. The answer to this is fighter aircraft and early detection. Fighter aircraft to provide air cover. Air superiority over any enemy attacking planes. For early detection, carrier-based radar picket planes stationed in a huge circle around the ship. And the long-ranging advanced design ship's radars, which keep up a constant search for unidentified aircraft. The data from these two radar sources, fed to the ship's combat information center, provide the ability to detect enemy planes hundreds of miles away making it almost impossible for enemy aircraft to penetrate within striking range of the ship without being detected. When an attacking force is discovered, pilots flying the most advanced fighter aircraft in the world streak toward the target at speeds over 1,600 miles per hour, fast enough to engage the enemy long before he can do any damage. The carrier's modern complex computer system, the Naval Tactical Data System, works out fighter deployment and intercept problems in millionths of a second. Allows the Combat Information Center to evaluate any threat and vector fighter aircraft to the target. In this day of modern warfare, Enemy aircraft or missiles may approach a task force at speeds of thousands of miles an hour. And simultaneous attacks from several directions at once are to be expected. Some fighters carry such advanced electronic equipment and weapons that a second crew member is needed, a radar intercept officer who works closely with the pilot. Together, they're capable of intercepting and destroying enemy aircraft under all weather conditions. They may never even glimpse the target. If necessary, a plane's range can be extended by air-to-air -air refueling. Specially designed clip-on belly tanks transform many carrier planes into tankers. And if a plane returns to the carrier low on fuel, these tanker planes are always available. When a mission is completed and it's time to go home, the floating airfield has changed position because it's always on the move. But it's where the pilots expect it to be.
sack carrier. She's a place of business for the crew. A sometime name in the paper to the public. A job well done to the shipyard worker. A most welcome sight to a returning pilot. She presents many faces to many people. Perhaps the most significant face she shows is to a potential enemy. To a hostile country, the attack aircraft carrier is an unwelcome sight, and for good reason. One of the most difficult to neutralize weapons is the attack carrier. It's always on the move, difficult to keep up with, hard to pinpoint, and hazardous to attack. What does a potential enemy do? Well, he goes to a limited war concept. Korea, for example. The enemy finds himself confronted with the attack carrier. Aerial cover and support for amphibious landings at Ponang and Incheon. Cover for the successful evacuation of 100,000 troops and their equipment at the Chosun Reservoir. Even when the enemy captured the airfields in South Korea, he didn't achieve air superiority. Carrier pilots were right in there, flying thousands of sorties. In 1955, attack carriers cover the evacuation of the Tachin Islands. 1956, cover during the Suez Crisis for the evacuation of 1,700 United States citizens. 1957, a show of force in the Eastern Mediterranean. 1958, Kimoi and Matsu. Simultaneously in Lebanon, carriers provide air cover for Marine Corps amphibious landings. Nineteen sixty, carriers off the Congo for possible evacuation of citizens and on the alert during the Berlin crisis. Nineteen sixty one, off Guatemala and Nicaragua to help prevent any invasion from the sea. 1962, Cuban Missile Crisis. Quarantine and the readiness to aid in forcing missile removal if necessary. Plus, constant surveillance of inbound ships. constant surveillance of Cuba itself. And 1964, the Tonkin Gulf and Vietnam. Crisis after crisis, carrier aviation has met the challenge. The advent of nuclear-powered carriers and escort vessels 
has made the carrier task force even more mobile, even more frustrating to an enemy. As ships and planes become more and more sophisticated, they will demand more and more of the men who serve in them. And this challenge, too, will be met. initiate a crisis, no matter how remote and inaccessible, no matter how far from the United States land base, a face of our nation will appear, the attack aircraft carrier, and the men who make her what she is.